forgot there was a countdown, so I totally fucked that one up. Oh well. Oh boy. Never mind. God, it's been a while since we've done any sort of recording or anything, eh? It has been. It has been. Well, we've had, what, you changing jobs, Clint's dealing with that farm, I've been away and sick, and all of that kind of stuff. Life just gets in the way, doesn't it? Unfortunately, yes, and we don't make enough to just stop. <laughs> oh, dude, I wish. I mean, there's nothing like having a hard day at work and then just thinking, yeah, there's like a 16-year-old on YouTube making dog shit videos and earning like $20 million a year. There's, there's nothing more depressing than that thought. That is quite literally a very depressing thought. <laughs> All right, well, since we are here, we might as well start the episode. So, you are listening to the Micro Machines podcast. This is episode, I think we're up to 71. Episode 71, not including any live streams. I think the live streams will be kept kept uh, separate. So, yeah, this is episode 71. You have, um, I've forgotten how we do this. (laughs) <laughs> Alright, so this week we are going to be talking about Allied Armoured Cars, a general overview episode. But before we do that, we'll do our usual introduction. So you have me, Callum, from New Zealand, just having a nice black coffee. And I'm having a black coffee because I ran out of milk the other day, so and I needed the caffeine. Rip, well, you got me, Garrison, out here in Kansas. I'm drinking a white monster because uh, Callum knows why. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be working on some figures during this episode. Looking forward to it. Very nice. Very nice. So, as I said this week, talking about Allied Armored Cars. Why? Well, I felt like it. Um, I generally, Whenever I'm picking a subject, it's usually uh, whichever one is um, sort of my fancy, whatever I'm interested in that week. Yes, I'm a little bit ADHD when it comes to stuff like that, but Oh, well. Shit, I'm not complaining. I didn't have to make the slides. <laughs> so this this episode, we're going to be talking about Allied Armored Cars as an overview. So we'll be looking at a, a selection of Armored Cars from the Allies, because, of course, you have the Axis ones, and they have a shit ton of them. For now, we're just going to be looking at Allied, and also this is a sort of generalization, letting you know what they have, what kits you can make of it as a sort of... Um, Kind of just to give you, the listeners, a sort of idea about them and maybe some inspiration or, you know, maybe you're just thinking about something to build or something to look into, something to deep dive into if you really want to. So that's what we're doing. And first up, we are going to do this in absolutely no particular order at all, except for alphabetical. Um, (laughs) And first up, we have... The AEC Armored Car. Nice. Three variants of this, the Mark 1 to the Mark 3, built in Britain. So, the AEC aimed to create an armored car with firepower and protection comparable to contemporary British cruiser tanks. The initial model was equipped with a turret from a Valentine Mark II infantry tank, featuring a two-pounder gun. Subsequent versions saw upgrades, including a custom turret with either a six-pounder or 75-millimeter gun which is, for an armoured car, quite a bit of firepower, that's, to be honest. Yeah, I was about to say, that's that's pretty good firepower. Yeah. The vehicle also came with a Baser machine gun, a 2-inch bomb thrower for smoke launcher, smoke grenades, a number 19 radio, and a number 19 radio set. The Mark One variant had a Bren light machine gun for air defence. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> They're right. Fucking 30 <laughs> rounds of three oh three. good luck. But later models were upgraded with a PLM mount for one or two Vickers K machine guns. The turret was powered electrically, but could also be traversed manually. The driver had two periscopes for visibility when the vehicle was buttoned up, but could elevate his seat to see over the glacis when necessary. The engine was installed in a downward angle to minimize the transfer shaft angle and reduce the height of the rear hull deck. Under normal road conditions, only the front two wheels were driven. The Mark I made its combat debut in North Africa in late 1942, with some units reportedly equipped with a Crusader tank turret and a six-pounder gun. Mark II and Mark III variants were employed in Europe by British and British Indian Army units, often alongside American-supplied staghound armoured cars. Hell yeah. 
The AEC armored car, particularly in its 75mm gun configuration, replaced US half-track 75mm self-propelled guns in the fighting squadrons of certain armored car regiments. It remained in service after World War II until it was replaced by the Elvis Saladin. The Lebanese army continued to use the vehicle at least until 1976, and from 1956 some AEC turrets were mounted on stair-count armored cars for use in Lebanon. So we have three variants here. Top left is a Mark I, the original version with a Valentine tank turret. 129 of these were built. Some units in the Middle East had a six-pounder gun fitted. In the middle here, we have a Mark II, featuring a larger turret with a three-man crew and a six-pounder gun, redesigned front hull, and a 155-horsepower diesel engine. Top right, we have the Mark III, close support armored car variant. Um, with the Mark II six-pounder replaced with the Q quick-firing 75mm gun on the same mountings, uh, you will notice that the barrels kind of look similar. And also, there was an AA prototype, which I couldn't find a photo for. Had a turret similar to the Crusader AA tank turret with twin Orlikin 20mm cannons capable of high elevation to engage enemy aircraft. The prototype was built in 1944, but, not, but did not enter production due to Allied air superiority in Northern Europe. Get Germany. Pretty much. And I just want to say that Mark II, there in the center. With the camo? Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, See, I, I'm i more of the Mark I. I, I like the Mark I a bit better than the it, The Mark I looks more fun. But it looks the Mark a bit II's more... camo is like... Mwah. Yeah. Like the the Mark One has got this sort of aggressiveness to its look, like it, you know, it's like it's it's, it's about the raw to... dog, the fucking hedgerows. Yeah, like it it looks purpose built, whereas the the other two sort of look like the turrets have just been slapped on as an afterthought. I don't know, even though the even though technically the Mark One is literally taking a turret off one tank and putting it onto it, whereas the other two are designed purpose for it. I don't, you know, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying. But either way. If you want to build any one of these three marks, you just got to look to Mini Art. They have the Mark One, Mark Two, and Mark Three. Uh, the Mark Two comes with the uh, camouflage scheme. The Mark Three in the European Theatre Green, and the Mark One in the North African Desert Scheme. All three of these, I really, really want. And I think the Mark Very Two nice. is actually that that scheme. That is, what's that flag? There's a flag on the side, and I'm trying to figure out which one it is. Uh, blue, white, red. Isn't that Dutch? Yeah, with a red star in the middle. Oh, Liberty? okay. No, something yeah. of that sort of era. I don't know what it is, but looks cool. I like it. It does look cool. However, it does mean you'll be building mini art. So, little give and take there. <laughs> Up next, we have the BA ten. <clears throat> Nice. So, this is, uh, I know Russia had quite a few armored cars. This is the one that I find found most of the information. Of course, this is an overview, so this is just a generalization. A lot of the Russian, um, the Soviet armored cars all kind of look the same. Although, in saying that, so the British and the American, if a design works, don't change it. So, the BA-10 was a Soviet armored car designed in 1938 and produced until 1941. It became the most widely manufactured Soviet heavy armored car before 1941, with 3,311 units built in three main versions. The standard BA-10, the upgraded BA-10M, which included a new radio, and the BA-10ZHD, modified for both rail and road use. That is awesome. <laughs> Imagine that thing on a fucking rail car, bro. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. The BA-10 improved upon the earlier BA-3 and BA-6 models, featuring an enhanced gas AAA chassis and armor up to 15mm thick on the front and turret. Although the BA-10 was intended to be replaced by the BA-11, which was to feature a diesel engine and advanced armor, the outbreak of World War II halted the BA-11's production. Consequently, the BA-10 continued to serve with the Red Army until 1945. Captured examples was used by Finland, at least 24 units, with three being sold to Sweden, Germany, and other Axis powers across Europe. 
The BA-10 first engaged in combat against Japanese forces during the Battle of uh, Kalkengol. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not too sure. Uh, in Manchuria in 1939, and some were later employ employed by Manchuko, which is the... I think Manchuko is the Japanese puppet uh, government of Manchuria when they sort of, you know, took over things. I think that's who that is. It saw action with in various Soviet military operations and campaigns from 1939 to 1940. During World War II, the BA-10 fought against German forces in on the Eastern Front, but became increasingly rare after the winter of 1941 to 1942, probably because they got schwacked. I was about to say, I wonder why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turns out 15 millimeters of armor ain't doing shit. <laughs> Imagine a fucking 88 smashing into that thing, bro. There'd be nothing left. Dude, just fucking... <laughs> Even a high explosive 88 would probably do some damage against 15 mil. Just fucking shred it, bro. Yeah. So, by the late, later stages of the war, lighter tanks such as the T-60 and T-70 had largely taken over the heavy scouting role. Despite this, a few BA-10s were still active as late as 1943 on the Leningrad front. Captured BA-10s were also used by Axis forces in Europe. In May 1945, some BA-10s from the Russian Liberation Army participated in the Prague Uprising. So... Uh, the nice. BA-10, if you look at the top left, could be uh, turned into a, quote, half track, end quote, uh, <laughs> by the use of a track that you could uh, wrap around the quad. I think it had, f it's got four wheels on the back, but they're not jeweled up. So, but you could wrap a, um, a tank track around it, basically, and turn it into a half track. But that is half track in quotes. <laughs> it's sort of like a convertible. Yeah, half track from Wish. Yeah. Either way, I gotta say, I do like the look of the B-18. It is, it's definitely got a Soviet look to it, but I think it's quite good. Very Soviet, very rustic. Yeah. Now, if you want to build a B-18, um, turns out there's not too many model kits for it. Um, if you're desperate in 35th, uh, the best you can get is a Hobby Boss um, Soviet B-18. Uh, in 1 to 100, you have Sevesda. In 48 scale, you have UM. In 56 scale, uh, you have Rubicon models. Um, other than that, like, I wasn't seeing too many. I would have thought, you know, companies like Trumpeter, Trumpeter do a lot of Soviet stuff. You would think that they would have a BA-10. Um, yeah, you, I, it's just something like this. I would have thought there'd be more to it, you know? I mean, yeah. they made over 3,000 of these, and they were used quite a bit, but I don't know. They'd... Either way. Uh, I think uh, I think it'd be nice if TACOM made a series of armored cars and made this. Oh, yeah. Like, could you imagine something like this where they got the big, do big doors and stuff on them? You had a full interior kit? Oh, dude, full interior kit would be so easy to do with this. Like, they'll be, I mean, it's Soviet, so they'll be fuck all in it. Um, Fair. But Where's know, all got, the detail? Yeah. <laughs> it's realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the detail? This is what the Soviets had. <laughs> but see how you got, you got like big side doors. So you imagine you could have a full detail set inside and have those door open, doors open. You could see quite a bit from there. Oh, 100%. All right. Moving on to the letter C, we have the Coventry Armored Car. Not much about this one, because it wasn't used a lot. So, the Coventry Armoured Car was a British 4x4 fighting vehicle developed towards the end of World War II as a potential replacement for the Humber and Daimler armoured cars. Designed to be a standardised model for both manufacturers, the Coventry aimed to simplify production with a unified design. Developed jointly by the Daimler Company and the Roots Group, the Coventry sought to utilise the production capabilities of both firms. Roots had a larger production cap capacity, whilst Humber's design was more complex compared to Daimler's. The overall design of the AFV W.19, which is what it was um, labelled as, was managed by Humber at Coventry, with Daimler providing the suspension and steering, and Comma, a, um, a subsidiary of Roots, God, I'm struggling today, supplying the axes, axles and transmission. 
Boy, this is a real like team effort. Hey, real and, quick. And of course, as we all know, nothing bad ever happens when you combine bloody companies. Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to say something real quick. Go for it. That picture on the right. Yeah, that's the one at Bovington, which I've seen. Yes. And then the one on the lower left. Yep. Look at it quick enough. The turret looks like a little, like a mini King Tiger turret. It is a bit, doesn't it? Just from that yeah. angle. It's got that same sort yeah. of sloping, yeah. Actually, what's on the top of that one on the bottom left? It looks like, it's got like a, looks like, I'm not sure, but it kind no, it of... Wouldn't be, it wouldn't be night optics that early. Nah. I'm not sure, maybe it's a mounting of some sort. Alright, so the Coventry featured a layout similar to the more compact Daimler, but incorporated a conventional sus suspension and drive system. It included rear driving controls, adapted from the Daimler, to enable quick disengagement from combat situation, also known as the, the hurry up and run away. The vehicle was powered by an American Hercules engine, connected to a central transfer box that distributed power to both front and rear differentials. The main production versions were two main production versions were developed. The Mark One featured a three-man turret armed with a 40 mm quick-firing two-pounder engine. Not fucking engine, a gun. <laughs> I was about to say, wait a second, what? <laughs> two-pounder engine. Woo! What the fuck? <laughs> And a, a 7.92mm coax Baser machine gun. Prototypes from both Daimler and Humber were tested in 1944 with a two-pounder gun. In 1943, orders were placed for 1,700 vehicles, 1,150 from Roots and 550 from Daimler, with the capability to mount the 57mm quickfire and six-pounder gun. A planned version, the AFVW90, was designed to include a larger turret and a 75mm gun, but with one fewer crew member with 900 units ordered. Production of the Coventry Mark I commenced in June 1944, with 63 vehicles completed by the end of the year. However, by 1943, it was decided to continue using the Daimler rather than trying to fully replace it with the Coventry. As a result, the order for the two-pounder Coventry was, due to, was reduced to 300 units, for deployment in India, with the 75mm armed Mark II version not entering production. Final production in 1945 saw an additional 220 units completed. Although the Coventry was deployed by the British Army, it, it arrived too late for significant wartime impact. Some units were sold to France and later saw action against the Viet Minh during the Indochina War. Ooh. I gotta say, uh, a reoccurring theme with a lot of these uh, armored cars, just a heads up, they end up being used a lot in very small conflicts around the war after the Second World War, which, I gotta say, when you find out where, they ha where they've been and like which countries they've been um, used in, the potential for dioramas just suddenly skyrockets for them, because they're not just restricted to World War II. Suddenly you've got all these micro-conflicts around the world with all these different sort of uh, decals and stuff like that. It would be fucking awesome. Like, you, they got it. Yeah, you know, you know what I initially thought of when he said the Indochina War. What? Um, <laughs> it that and maybe like a, another vehicle or two on a road in uh, like the bush, and you got the fucking v, VC over there, um, pushing through like it's like it's an ambush, right? Yeah. And then you got the uh, the the rest of the infantry from the column who are uh, kind of retreating. Kind of like, uh, you've seen We Were Soldiers, right? Oh, yeah, that... That, um... that beginning scene? Yeah, yeah, with the... Yeah, some, yeah. yeah something like that That'd be would cool. be fucking awesome. Ooh. All right, so if you want to build a Coventry armored car, you're kind of limited as fuck. You either have a... You have a Tamiya kit from... 19 god knows how old just <laughs> looking at it like it looks like it's from the 50s uh, yeah um like you know we're talking an old school of tamia that's so old i barely recognize the bloody branding for it but i know it's tamia um plus the the, the box art kind of just looks at the, the proportions of the actual vehicle are wrong 
But um, yeah, I mean that fifty cal that's sitting on top of it looks a little bit funky, unless it's a French gun. I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. It, it also it making almost the... looks like a disco and a fifty had a baby. Yeah, and kind of like they've got the speed lines coming off the uh, the car, so it makes it look like it's doing about a hundred miles an hour. Um, <laughs> Uh, apart from that, uh, if you want to, you can either make the Mark One or the Mark Two from Scott Cast. There is a these are resin kits and they are in thirty fifth scale. And I got it. I will put my hand up and say I would happily have either one of these. Although I think I would probably go for the smaller turreted Mark One. I don't know why. I just I, I think I'd go for the Mark One Two or the Mark One also because. It just looks better than the Mark yeah. II, in my opinion. I, th I think, I think for me, it, like uh, having a too large a turret just puts me off it. Whereas a smaller turret that sort of fits in with the form of the armored car I'm into. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, th I think that's it. It's kind of like it looks where, like it's supposed to be there, as opposed to just retrofitted. It's it's uh, also giving M8 vibes. The Mark One. Yeah. 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 All right. On to the next one, we have the Daimler Armoured Car. Nice. So, the Daimler Armoured Car was highly effect was a highly effective British design from World War II that remained in use through, to through the 1950s. Initially intended for armed reconnaissance and liaison missions, it also served as an internal security vehicle in several countries during the post-war period. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, former, former British Daimler Armoured Cars were exported to various Commonwealth nations. By 2012, some of these vehicles were still in operation in the Qatari army. That is oh my pretty God. awesome, to be honest. <laughs> that that fucking 2012. Sweet. Oh, that is so cool. I bet trying to find parts was an absolute bitch, especially for like being in Qatari. But you know, Qatar, which is a fucking Bro, desert, which makes you, maintenance even worse. You know, they were HIDFing that shit at some oh, point. Yeah. I bet half the actual vehicle was no longer Daimler. <laughs> Probably not. So, the Daimler armoured car saw action in North Africa with the 11th Hussars and the Derbyshire Yeomanry. That is an interesting name. And was also deployed in Europe with a few units reaching the Southeast Asia Theatre. In late war Northwest Europe, a typical reconnaissance troop would include two Daimler armoured cars alongside two Daimler Dingo Scout cars. Uh, side note, there are a whole bunch of armoured scout cars, uh, a bit like the uh, Daimler Dingo, uh, that are classified as armoured cars. However, I am not going to, I'm not including those into this episode because those are going to be made into their own separate sort of scout reconnaissance uh, car episode at some point because I think they deserve an entire different category on their own sort of thing. So oh, yeah. hence why these are more turreted armoured cars, heavier ones, whereas those ones are more reconnaissance, light scouts kind of things. And I think they deserve it, their own episode. So, hence why... Works for me. Yeah. So, the British Indian Army's 16th Light Cavalry, part of the 14th Army, was equipped with Daimlers and used them during the reconquest of Burma. Ooh, a, Bur a uh, Indian Burma um, Daimler would look cool. Indeed. To enhance gun performance, some Daimlers in the European theatre were fitted with the Little John adapter for their two-pounder guns. This adapter, which employed the squeeze-bore principle, improved armour penetration, allowing the guns to penetrate the side and rear armour of certain German tanks. Do you know what a squeeze-bore is? Uh, no. Okay, so, a squeeze-bore. The Germans uh, used these on very early... You know in War Thunder... Uh, the ver like one of the first German ver tanks, well armored cars. It's got this weird gun on the front of it. It's like a two man two man armored car. Uh never play the Krauts in War Thunder. Well, they they have a cannon. That it's um, it's a, a the caliber is it is caliber, uh, twenty eight to twenty millimeter. So, at the breach, the gun is. 28 millimeter right okay. at the end of the barrel is 20 mil what yeah so a squeeze what it does is a squeeze bore is the barrel gets smaller right to the end and basically the pressure sort of deforms the round any deforms the round but uh because it suddenly gets all this pressure it comes out a lot faster it's just slightly deformed 
So you do get a very high velocity coming out of a standard round. Um, what, the only why didn't is they the, implement that into tanks? Well, mainly it's a sort of uh, last-ditch attempt to try and like upgrade guns because the rounds came out a bit deformed, so the penetration was a bit um, random. But mm. also, because of the nature of squeeze bore, where you're exerting this uh, insane amount of pressure onto the barrels, the barrels wore out. I think the German one, the barrel wore out after maybe 30 rounds went through it. Holy shit! Yeah, uh, so it is it's very much just a, a stopgap type thing until you can get a bigger gun. Or, you know, but I don't know how, I don't know much, I don't know if the... Um, if the little John was even better, was better at it. But that—that that is the basic principle of a squeeze bore: is it starts out larger, smaller at the end, and it just—and it's just purely to generate more pressure behind it, so the round comes out a higher velocity. That's all. Oh, huh. yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting concept when you think about it. It's just—it's not a long. It is very much a short-term use thing. Very ballsy. I mean, imagine being the first one to test that. Oh, yeah. Could you imagine if the barrel just became weak enough that the whole thing just exploded when you fired the round? I mean, that's kind of scary to think about. It's like, all right, Johnny, we're going to be behind <laughs> this concrete wall over here. All you got to do is stand next press to the gun. that button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pull this cord. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so Daimler's remained in use with British Army territory units until the 1960s, surpassing the Coventry armored car, which was intended to replace them. As late as January 1960, B Squadron 11th Hussars was still operating Daimlers and Daimler Dingoes in Northern Ireland. In the Indian Army, the 63 Cavalry initially had a squadron equipped with Humber armoured cars. This squadron later became an independent reconnaissance unit and, and was re-equipped with Daimlers. In the early 1960s, both Humbers and Daimlers from the Indian Army were used by the President's bodyguard and were deployed in the defence of Trushul during the Sino 1962 Sino India Indian War, and I know I definitely pronounced that wrong, but I don't care. Fuck it. In 1959, the Ceyl the Ceylon Army. Can you get, take a guess who the Ceylon Army is? Uh was it Ceylon, Kalon, whatever. Uh yeah, some small fuck off African country. Sri Lankan. It's the Sri Lankan Army. Oh. So they acquired. 12 Daimler armoured cars to equip its newly established 1st Reconnaissance Regiment. Jesus Christ, what the f... Oh, who the f... No, no Kyle, 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 wait. Love that, Kyle, but we're recording. Uh, that blew out my ears when that notification went through. <laughs> uh, anyway... So, these Daimlers continued to serve with the Sri Lankan Armoured Corps until the late 1990s. They were notably involved in the 1971 JVP insurrection and the early stages of the Sri Lankan Civil War, including the First Battle of Elephant Pass, where at least one Daimler was destroyed. So the Daimlers actually lasted for a long time. I think because they'll probably just they probably just kept going. It's a bit like buying a Toyota. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll replace it when it dies, and then you're sitting there 20 years later going, I still have the bastard. Yeah, right. It won't <laughs> go away. <laughs> it's like it just won't die. And if you want to buy, if you want to build your own Daimler armored car, well, you have two options. You either have IBG, who build them and who make them in both 70, uh, no, they just make them in 70 second scale. So they have the Mark 1 and the Mark 2. And if you want to build them in 35th, you have Gecko models. They also have the Mark 1 and the Mark 2 World War 2 version. I think personally, I would want the uh, Gecko models. And yeah. I. I think I would go with the. Oh, I think I stick with the Mark One. To be honest, again, I'm a sucker for earlier versions of things, so I'd, I'd have to go with the Mark One. Although the 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 markings for the Mark Two, where you got the Hussar, um, yeah, on the front is kind of. Uh, I, I, I kind of fuck with the Mark Two. Not gonna lie, bro. Yeah, I don't. Know. It's just this one, the Mark One. It's got the um, the long barrel two pounder with the uh, exhaust vent. On, I think. Yeah, it's, it's just got this weird hot. sort of barrel on it. I kind of like it. Yeah. But yeah, IBG, Gecko, two very good companies, so you won't go wrong if you want it in 72nd scale or 35th. Up next, we have the Fox Armoured Car. 
This one is... What the fuck? It looks sad. Uh... <laughs> Bro, look at the barrels. It looks sad. <laughs> It's like, oh sorry, honey, I just, it just won't get up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> if you're cold, they're cold. Bring them inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do, I do like this photo though. In the background, you got all the the other vehicles. That, that's right. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so the Fox armored car built by General Motors in Canada. So this is a Canadian vehicle. The vehicle was based on the British Humber armored car Mark III, but adapted to fit a Canadian to fit a Canadian military pattern truck chassis, or the CMP, as we all know about them. Uh, if you want to learn more about the CMP, go to the episode we did with uh, Don. He was absolutely enjoying himself on that episode. Yes. He, he is a big fangirl for CMPs. It featured a manually traversing turret equipped with both a 30 cal and 50 cal Browning machine gun. Ooh. The crew compromised of a vehicle commander, gu driver, gunner, and wireless operator. A total of 1,500 units were produced. It's interesting that having t two calibers of machine gun in the turret, a 50 and a 30. Like, That's honestly did... before it's time. Well, like, what? I wonder what the, the whole idea between having the two calibers in one turret is. I mean, they're both anti-personnel. I mean, a 30 cal and a 50 cal will do the same thing to a human. <laughs> Um, Probably because they didn't want to expose themselves outside the turret in order to use, like, the 50, so they had, like, more hard cover. They could utilize the 50 while still in the turret and button up. I guess the 50 would be better for if they're hiding behind something, wouldn't it? Using, oh, 100%. Using the 30, and then suddenly they're behind a block wall. It's like, oh, well, 50 time, boom, boom, boom. It's Pretty like, much. What? It's like, what wall? Yes. All right, so the vehicle saw service in Italy, the UK, and India. Along among its operators were the Polish 15th Regiment. I am not producing. I am not trying to pronounce that name. Um, oh come on, you got this. I don't even know how to pronounce things in Polish, let alone that. It's like the the Polk Olano. No, I, no, no, nope. not, <laughs> not going to try. Um, which was used during combat in Italy from 43 to 44. After World War II, many of these vehicles were transferred to the Portuguese Army, where they were employed in a counterinsurgencies operation in Angola, Guinea, and Mozambique from 61 to 75. Those would be cool to model. Portuguese yes. in, like, Angola would be pretty cool. I need to find photos of that. I wonder if there are any photos. <clears throat> the Netherlands, facing a shortage of Humber armoured cars for the Dutch East Indies, acquired 39 of these vehicles. 34 of them were fitted with Humber Mark IV turrets, included, which included a 37mm gun. This hybrid vehicle, known as the Hum Fox, proved successful and popular with some units later transferred to the Indonesian Army following independence. Uh, this, I, do, I do like the, the Fox. I don't know why. I just I like it. And I would love to find a photo of a Portuguese one in Angola or Guinea or Mozambique. I mean, they got the. I I got to know what they look like. Like, have they have they got a funky camo? Have they got cool markings? I don't know. And but also, I think like just the sort of style of Angola, Mo, Mozambique, that sort of uh, landscape would be pretty cool to try and do a diorama of. Yes, it would be, but the vehicle itself just looks so goofy, I, I couldn't build it. <laughs> if I did, I would just make a plaque that says, sad boy. <laughs> well, unfortunately, if you do want to build one, I can only find a 3D printed one from Etsy in 72nd scale. So, uh... Wise! Yeah, we need to get Wise in on, in on this one, but... I think, uh... This, yeah, this is for uh, tabletop scale. This is tabletop gaming scale. I think it is, so yeah. I think that is what it's uh, going for. Right, up next we have the Guy Armoured Car. Guy Armoured Car. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a Guy Armoured Car. It's for the guys. For the guys. So, the Guy Armoured Car was a British armoured vehicle produced in limited quantities during World War II. It saw only limited action during the Battle of France. Due to production constraints, as the manufacturer was also producing artillery tractors, the, de the design and construction methods of the Guy armoured car were transferred to Roots. 
This collaboration served as the foundation for the development of the Humber armored car. You can kind of see the, both the Fox and the armored and the guy. The chassis is very much similar to the Humber when yes. you get to it. In 1938, Guy Motors built five prototypes of the Guy Quad armored car based on the Quad what is it? Quad Ant artillery tractor chassis designed by Woolwich Arsenal. Various 4x4 chassis were tested, but the Guy chassis were selected for production to expedite the process. By September 1938, Guy had built three armored cars. Is that it? All right. Three. It's not many. Three. And by That's not even a platoon. <laughs> That's not even a squad. Jesus. And by 1939 to 1940, a total of 101 units were produced, initially designated as Tank Light Wheeled Mark One. Yeesh. Only 101. That's, that's not many. That's kind of sad. While the original specification called for riveted construction, the cars were built for, with welded hulls, making them the first British armoured cars with this feature. Guy's suggestion for welding, which included the use of rotating jigs, allowed for faster and cheaper production. This innovation was later recognized by the Royal Commission for Awards to Inventors. That's cool. Nice. The armored car featured a welded hull with a sloped glazed plate and a centrally mounted turret. Their early models were equipped with a Vickers 50.5 in... Uh, fuck. A Vickers 0.50... You got this. Fuck me, I am struggling. It has a, half, has a half inch or a 12.7 millimeter machine gun, the Vickers version, and a coax .303 Vickers machine gun. Similar to the Fox, it's got the dual sort of machine um, machine gun types. It's just this one is the Vickers type, which means that water cooled, you could just fire that thing all day and all night. Which, nice. which is kind of a good idea for a vehicle, isn't it? Yes. The uh, Mark 1A model upgraded to a 15mm Baser machine gun and a 7.92mm Baser as the secondary weapon. The engine was located in the rear and the vehicle carried a number 19 radio set. So as you can see here, uh, the left one has the is the earlier version, earlier Mark 1 version with the two Vickers guns. And then the uh, one in the right here has the 15mm machine gun, which would definitely pack a punch. <clears throat> The design of the Guy armoured car laid the groundwork for the later Humber armoured car, which used a new ch chassis. Six Guy armoured cars were deployed to France with the British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF, but were lost when fell. What? <clears throat> but were lost when France fell to the Germans. In 1940, four of these vehicles, two each from the 12th Lancers and Second North Hampshire Yeomanry, Yeomanry, whatever. <laughs> had their guns removed and fitted with extra seats for for use in the Coates mission. A plan to evacuate King George VI, Queen Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth, and Princess Margaret in the event of a German invasion. The remaining cars were used by various various British Army, Belgian Army, Danish, and Dutch units stationed in Britain. By 1943, they had been replaced by more modern vehicles. It's kind of cool they, uh, they had these converted to... Um, get the royals out during the war just in case gotta gotta prepare for the royals to dip i mean at least you're going out in style true and unfortunately the only one that i can find is a bolt action guy armored car which is in a weird scale and kind of looks a bit not high quality looking at that one yeah, it's kind of a bit. That's it's got the sort of cartoonish look to it. I'm not it a does. fan, but it's bolt action, so I mean, yeah, it's tabletop. It's a tabletop one. All right, next up, we have talked, we have referenced this one a lot, and now we're going to finally talk about it because alphabetical order, the Humber armored car. This is a car that both Don and I have strong disagreements about. He says it looks like he looks. He says it looks horrible. I say it looks good. So the Humber armored car was among the was among the most extensively produced British armored vehicles of World War II. It complemented the Humber light reconnaissance car and remained in service throughout the war. 
The Guy company lacked the capacity to produce enough Guy armoured cars along with its other vehicles. So shortly after the war began, the Roots Group was approached to undertake uh, to take over production. Using the Guy design, Carrier adapted their KT-4 artillery tractor chassis and fitted it with welded bodies and turrets provided by Guy. The prototypes passed trials successfully, leading to an order of 500 units in 1940, with deliveries starting in 41. To avoid confusion with the Universal Carrier, the vehicles were, re- were renamed Armoured Car Humber Mark I, though they were produced by Carrier at Commoners Luton Works. The initial Humber models closely resembled the Guy Armoured Car, including its flaws, which were later corrected. The Mark III featured a three-man turret and production continued until 1942 with 1,650 units built. Despite being more complex than the Daimler armoured car, the Roots Group larger ca- production capacity allowed for, col- allowed for collaboration on a new design. While the Coventry armoured car, armed with a two-pounder gun, was being considered as a replacement, the Mark IV, the Mark IV was developed with a US 37mm gun but reduced crew capacity. Since the Coventry was not ordered, production of the Mark IV continued, totaling 2,000 units. It's, it's actually kind of astonishing how many things are built during the war. Yeah, you got to think about it too, like these things required crew mm. and maintenance people and like, holy fuck. Yeah, like, like think about it. 2,000 units, right? So you got 2,000 armored cars. That, they have a they have a crew of say let's say four, so that's eight thousand men crewing two thousand cars. Plus, you need about maybe five people for servicing, maybe. It's a lot. That is a lot. That is a lot of people. Just for an just car. for this specific type of Humber armored car. When you start getting into the numbers of the Second World War, it honestly starts getting scary. Like, it, it's almost like you cannot conceive it. Yeah. You know? Like, we'll, we focus on individual units or individual tanks and all that, but it's like this one, say, Sherman, is part of fucking 37,000 they made during the war sort of thing. And each are their own different design and numberings. And it gets a bit overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> right. <laughs> God, it's just try not to think about it too much, otherwise you give yourself a headache. So, <clears throat> the Humber armoured car was deployed in the North African campaign from late 1941 with the 11th Hussars, a cool name, and other units. It was also widely used in the European theatre by British and Canadian reconnaissance regiments. A few were assigned to patrol the Iran supply route, and a British Army, British Indian Army armoured car regiment equipped partly with Humbers, utilised them during the reconquest of Burma. In 1943, Portugal received several Humber vehicles, with most going to the army and 20 assigned to the National Republican Guard. After World War II, the Humber was used by various countries, including Egypt from 48 to 49, Burma, Ceylon, Cyprus, Denmark, India, Mexico and the Netherlands. The 16th Light Cavalry, an Indian Armoured Car Regiment, part of the 14th Army, also used the Humber during the Burma campaign. After India gained independence, the 63rd Cavalry was established with Humber Mark IV armoured cars in one of its squadrons. This squadron was later reorganised into an in, into an independent reconnaissance unit, and the original squadron was reformed with Daimlers. Both Humber, both Humber and Daimler armoured cars were used by the Indian Army's President's bodyguard during the 1962 Indochina War, where they were deployed at high altitudes for the defence of Shushul. I'm just going to pronounce it that way. Sorry if anyone gets offended. <laughs> Don't care. Be like that. In 1948, the Humber was used against the Indian Army by the 2nd and 4th. What the fuck? Hyder, Hyderban, Hyderabad? Hyderabad? Lancers during Operation Polo. I, I've, I've never heard of that before, but. I, nah, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> Additionally, Humber armoured ve- armored cars were deployed by the Portuguese garrison during the Indian invasion of Goa in December 1961. These vehicles equipped the four reconnaissance squadrons and engaged Indian forces in several skirmishes around the border villages of Doramagogo. Uh, I don't... Uh, whatever. As well as during the breakthrough at Mapuza. Why do I do this to myself? 
Either way, the Humber was used quite a lot. And if you want to build one, <clears throat> well, you have a few options. In 48 scale, you can get the Tamiya one, which I wouldn't mind having. In 35th scale, you have Bronco. Now, Bronco supply you with uh, multiple kinds. The Tamiya one is a Mark IV with the larger turret and the 37mm. However, Bronco also have the Mark IV. They have the Mark III, which has a 15mm baser. And the Mark II, which has the... Uh, I think the Mark II has the uh, two, the 50 and 30 cows in them. And those are in North Africa. Uh, I think out of all of them, I'd probably want the Mark IV. It's the rare time that I'll want a later version of something. Right, up next in the order, we have the M8 Greyhound. Now, I'm not going to speak too much about the Greyhound because we have done an extensive deep dive onto the Greyhound in an earlier episode. So I'm just going to say the bare basics here. And direct you guys to go and watch that one. That was one that uh, Garrison leads. I will Good say uh, the photo on the left is Baller with its uh, yellow and blue stripes. Uh, I quite like that look. The the picture on the right is also Baller as fuck rolling through Paris. Mm. So the M8 light armored car, a six by six vehicle produced by Ford during World War II was utilized by both US and British forces in Europe and the Pacific from 43 until the war's end. It was extensively exported and as of 2024 remains in some in service in some countries. That is awesome. I got to find those. Those that's got to be cool. Bro, you know the camo schemes go hard on those. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. As a reference to the last the episode we did on the M8 Greyhound, you should go have a look cuz some of those photos are pretty damn cool. In British service, the M8 was known as the Greyhound, a name rarely used by the U.S. Army because the U.S. Army don't know how to do cool naming. What do you mean? We got M2 everything, M3 everything, M1, M1 everything. everything, M4 everything, M5 everything. Um, when you say M1, is it the tank? Is it the gun? Is it the helmet? Is it oh, fucking God knows what else? All the above. Yeah. Mm. The British Army found it inadequately armoured, especially the hull floor, which could easily be penetrated by anti-tank mines. Nothing like having your ass blown off. To address this, crews lined the floors with sandbags. God, yes. can you imagine if it rained and those filled up with water? They would be heavy oh, as fuck. Oh god, water. heavy as fucking like shit. Engine would be like, no, no, kill me. No, there's too much. <laughs> Oh, great heavens, it's too heavy. <laughs> Despite its limitations, the M8 Greyhound was produced in large numbers and was valued for its excellent road mobility, making it a valuable asset in the American and British armor columns. Its performance off-road, particularly in muddy conditions, was less, impress was less impressive. Does this, make does this mean the Greyhound is a pavement princess? A pavement princess. God damn it, Callum. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just ruin the Greyhound for you? A little bit. <laughs> oh my god, it would be great yes. to do a vignette of the Greyhound of it stuck in mud and the plaque say Pavement Princess. Oh my god, you would piss off so many people as well. <laughs> I'm going to do it one day. Alright, if you want to build one. Well, you have quite a few good selections here. You've got three from Tamiya. Um, one in 48 and two in 35th. You have the just the standard... Uh, Greyhound, and then you also have the Combat Patrol set, which has a whole bunch of stowage, two figures. It's probably the better deal out of the two of them, to be honest. And I think it's uh, the more updated kit, so I think the the first Tamiya Greyhound was like probably the 70s, and then the uh, the next one was probably, was uh, I think, either retooled or new parts, but it was sort of updated a bit, so I'd, I'd say go for that uh, Combat Patrol set. Uh, in 35th as well, you also have the uh, special D-Day uh, edition for um, a, a Tallery, but I don't know if you want to put yourself through that sort of pain when you could just buy a Tamiya. And also recently, Andy's Hobby Headquarters released the uh, Greyhound in 16th scale, uh, also coming with a resin figure. It is a, uh, you can build either the early or late versions, and I think I think in 16th scale, the uh, Greyhound is a decent, would be like a, a decent size, not too big, but big enough where you could put a lot of cool details into it, I think. Yeah, agreed. I'm not a big 16th scale guy myself, but it'd be cool to see one. 
Yeah. Plus, it's got a, the the figure for it looks really good as well. Yes. Right. We haven't got many too many left. I mean, a lot of these have got very little in the way of information, except for the next two. So up up next, we have the Marmon Harrington Armored Car. This one's a what the fuck? It's a weird name. Bro, the the center bottom picture, what is that? Why is there a white fucking tire cover with that weird uh, ass camo? It's a proto it's a prototype. It was oh, a prototype. Okay. So the Marmon <laughs> Harrington went through a lot of changes, which I'm all about. It literally went from like this sort of design to this eight wheeled monstrosity sort of thing. So the Marmon Harrington armored car was a series of vehicles produced in South Africa. And adopted by actually little little close thing here. I think one of our episodes we're going to have to look at native South African vehicles because those things are interesting. Yes, like the, the South Africans, they did some interesting things with vehicles. I mean, they were the ones that developed the M wrap in a way. You know, the whole sort of like um, slanted underside for mines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think they were the first to utilize that design because of you know riots um anyway uh so produced in south africa and adopted by the british army during world war ii although these armored cars were issued to uh, were issued to raf armored car companies they were really they were really used in action with the raf favoring rolls royce armored cars and other types instead in 1938 south african authorities funded the development for of a new armoured car for the Union Defence Force. With the onset of World War II, the vehicle was based on a Ford three-ton truck chassis with, com with components imported due to South Africa's limited automotive industry. Ford Canada provided the chassis, M Marmon Harrington supplied the four-wheel drive system, and local companies handled the assembly. The first model, the South African Reconnaissance Vehicle Mark I, entered service in 1940. It featured a long wheelbase, a single drive, a single axle drive, and was armed with two Vickers machine guns. After seeing limited action in the Western Desert, it was primarily used for training. The Mark II, introduced later with a shorter wheelbase and four-wheel drive, known in British service as the Marmon Harrington Mark II, it was used extensively in, in North Africa. This variant was equipped with a boy's anti-tank rifle and a Bren light machine gun, or twin Vickers machine gun for sub-Saharan use. Modification by Allied troops included Mount mounting captured German or Italian anti-tank guns. As you can see, the top top center and top right, and, um, a Pac-36 and a, an Italian Breda um, anti-tank gun, which is kind of cool. Uh, here in the bottom right, you can see the Mark II with the boys' anti-tank rifle, which um, an interesting concept. You there? Garrison. My would be the one I would build. I wish I knew about it during the uh, North African group build. Hang on. Just for uh, just say that one more time. I had that paused. Yeah, I, I really like the Mark II. I, I really wish I would have known about it during the North Africa group build. But, uh, oh, yeah. Like the, the fact that they got, they can mount, like, any sort of gun onto it. I think having the boys anti-tank rifle though on a moving vehicle is an interesting idea. You know, a fucking yes. 0.55 caliber bolt action anti-tank rifle on a vehicle is like how good luck aiming that. I mean it's mounted but Yeah, fuck yeah. that. I think if you're close enough that you have to, that you can use a boys anti-tank rifle on something, I think you're fucked up. Like I, I don't think you want to get close enough to anything that requires an anti-tank rifle in something like this. I mean, I could, I could see it in the urban as an ambush vehicle. Yeah. Like an initial ambush and then, you know, scoot and sh shoot and scoot, and get the fuck out. I mean, sure, surely it must have provided something if they did use it, you know. Like, they did mount the boys on a lot of vehicles, like the Bren carrier and stuff like that. So it must, it must have been done something or... Is it just one of those, it's better than having nothing? That's a good question. Mm. I need to do a little bit of research into that. Anyway, the Mark III, with thicker armor and a shorter wheelbase, was produced in large numbers until mid-1942. 
Some were sent to the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army, where they were used with twin Vickers machine guns and continued service throughout the through the Indonesian National Revolution. In March 1943, the redesigned Mark IV and Mark IV-F was introduced, featuring a monocoque design, rear-mounted machine, rear-mounted engine, and a two-pounder gun with a coax Browning machine gun. Due to supply issues, the Mark IV-F used a Ford Canada drivetrain. By late 1943, with the end of the North African campaign and changing needs, further versions were only prototypes. So the a Mark IV-F is in the top left here. Uh, I, I prefer the earlier versions. I got to say, just I I kind of fuck with the top right. I ain't gonna lie, that like half shield. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got a weird jerry rigged sort of look to it that is just appealing. Yes. A total of five thousand seven hundred and forty six Marmon Harrington armored cars were built. South Africa's Jesus. South African units used about four thousand five hundred, while others were employed by British, Indian, New Zealand. Greek, Free French, Polish, Dutch, East Indies, and Belgian forces. Post-war, they saw action with the Arab Legion in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, and were used by the Cypriot National Guard during the 1947 Turkish invasion of Cyprus. Greek forces continued using them until 1990s, when they were phased out in favour of newer vehicles. Jesus. Hmm. So, we have the Mark I to the Mark VIII. And we're just going to do a quick go through on each one of them. So the Mark One, equipped with two 303 inch Vickers machine guns, one in a cylindrical turret and one in the hull's left rear. That was weird. Uh, this model was a two wheel drive with 113 built. The Mark Two featured the lengthened um, chassis. Um, same uh, same armament as the Mark One, but later versions were upgraded with an octagonal turret housing a boys anti tank and a Bren. My, uh, machine gun. Pintle mountings for Vickers machine and Bren machine guns were added but rarely used. Hulls were, rivet hulls were riveted on early units and welded on later ones. Total of 887 units were produced. You have the Mark 3 and 41, similar to the Mark 2 but with slightly shorter wheelbase. This thing just kept getting shorter and shorter. Later production models had a, had a single rear door, no radiator grill, no headlight covers. A total of 2,630 were produced. You had the Mark III A, which uh, replaced the turret with a ring mount for two 30.303-inch uh, Vickers KEs, projected by a steel skirt. The A denoted the change in armament. You have the Mark IV, complete redesign. Um, it had uh, 12 millimeters of armor in the front, 6 millimeters of side armor, armed with the quick-firing 2-pounder and a 2-man turret. Later models included a coax Browning machine gun and an anti-aircraft Vickers or Browning machine gun on the roof turret. 2,000, use, 2000 units were built. Post-war, some units had their turrets modified or replaced. Mark IV-F, of course, as we said, was uh, basically a Mark IV, but just used uh, Canadian Ford F60L chassis. A uh, total of 1,200 of these were built. A Mark V, which is the weird one in the center there. Uh, an eight-wheel design powered by two Albion engines. Initial prototypes had poor performance in desert conditions and were later modified with rear engines. Despite its heavy armor, the, the vehicle was still underperforming, leading to the project's cancellation. Only one prototype was built, armed with a quick-firing six-pounder gun and armored sides, side skirts. A Mark VI returned to the eight-wheel design with two Mercury V8 engines and front and rear wheel steering i bet that thing had a great turning circle oh oh yes <laughs> two prototypes were built one with a two pounder and one with a six pounder in an open top turret uh, with electric travis and 10 to 30 millimeters of sloped armor additional armament including two to three machine guns a two pounder version was sent to the uk for evaluation but had transmission issues the two-pounder is now at the Bovington Tank Museum, while the other remains in South Africa. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, what are you laughing about? It just, it's just South Africa, bro. It's just, <laughs> they're always wild. <laughs> you have a Mark Seven, which was an improved Mark Three a armed with only a Vickers machine gun, uh, discontinued after prototyping. And lastly, you have the Mark Eight, similar to the Mark Three, but with a larger turret and a two-pounder. Production was halted in 1943 to focus 
and the focus shifted to larger weapons like the six pounder. If you want to build any one of these, uh, seems like your only options is IBG. However, they are in 35th scale. So you have a Mark I uh, Af South African reconnaissance vehicle. You have a Mark II uh, mobile field force type and a Mark II Middle East type. I believe one of these also is supplied with New Zealand decals, which is what I really, really want. Ooh. I think it's the Middle East one. Nice. Actually, yes, this is the... <laughs> silly me. This is the New Zealand one on the box art because it's got the silver fern on the, on the nose there. I would love to build that. However, I would love any one of these. The uh, Mark I has a sort of old school style to it, especially with the machine gun sticking out the side. I, I honestly fuck with the uh, the Mark II Middle East. Mm. I mean, it's got the 50 on top. It's got the anti-tank rifle. It's got, I mean, it, the camo is really nice. Mm. Um, and it's New Zealand. It, you can't go wrong. <clears throat> I haven't built anything New Zealand yet, so that, that might be a good first New Zealand build. Yeah. All right, up next, we have something French. The Panard 178 yeah. AMD 35. <laughs> it, it looks just like a pickup truck. It honestly does, but I kind of like it. Where's the so, dish go? <laughs> so the Panard 178, officially known as the... Oh, fuck me. Why do I do this to myself? The Auto... Automatilius de... Nope. Not doing it. <laughs> The Panhard 178 was an advanced French 4x4 reconnaissance armoured car designed for the French Army Cavalry before World War II. Nicked name Pan Pan, it featured a crew of four and armed with a 25mm main gun and a 7.5 coax machine gun. After the fall of France in 1940, the Germans took over many of the, these vehicles and used them as the Panzerspitzwagen P204F. Production briefly continued under German control following the armistice. Post-war, France resumed production of a with a modified version, the Panard 178B. In December 1931, the French cavalry began planning for future armoured fighting vehicles, including a long-range reconnaissance vehicle known as the AMD. Specifications were finalised in December 1932, calling for a four-ton vehicle with a 400km range, 70km per hour top speed, which is terrifying in an armoured vehicle. Uh, yes. Uh, five to eight. Tall. Oh yeah, uh, five to eight millimeters of armor, a twenty millimeter gun, and a seven point five millimeter machine gun. Uh, d d d d by nineteen thirty three, Panard had was selected to build a prototype alongside competitors Renault, Billot, and Latil. The Panard. Uh, prototype completed in October 1933 and tested in nearly 1934 was initially accepted despite being heavier than the target weight. By 1934, the vehicle was officially adopted as the AMD Panard Model 1935. Production saw several modifications. The first 30 vehicles had basic vision equipment, lacked silencers, and featured semicircular wheel plate cutoffs. Later changes included armoured ventilator covers, a Panard factory plate on the nose, a new camouflage pattern, stowage boxes on the back fenders, and a backward-facing episcope on the turret for the commander. i got to say, the French knew how to do a camo scheme. Yeah, the French camos have always been very unique. Yeah, like they put a lot of effort into them. Uh, let's see. In April 1937, the first 19 Panard 178s entered service with the 6E Cuirassiers. By the outbreak of World War II, 218 vehicles were deployed across 11 squadrons. In spring 1940, the 21 Esquadron de AMD 35, initially assigned to Finland for the Winter War, was redirected to Narvik, Norway for Operation Weisenberg. Weisenberg? I don't know. This squadron, formerly of the 4E GRDI, was equipped with 13 Panard 178s. During the Battle of France, starting May 10th, 1940, approximately 370 178s were in service, re reallocated to reconnaissance units of mechanized and motorized forces. At this time, the Panard 178 was one of the best armored cars in its class. I gotta say, the, the French 25mm gun was actually a fairly decent anti-tank gun. 
apparently. Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Uh, I pulled up on my phone and because I was looking at the armored car on the computer mm. and looking at the guys on the top right, and I just pulled it up on my phone. It is literally two people tall. Yeah, that thing is. It is really tall. That that one is a modified version for Vietnam. Well, Indochina back then. Could you imagine going just 20 miles an hour and taking a sharp left? I mean, it must be heavy enough along the bottom to, like, not flip itself. I I would hope, but the turret just looks like... Oh, God, it just looks like it's it's ready to tip on over, bro, and be a casemate at that point. <laughs> it's like, can't move the turret, can't do anything, can't move the vehicle, you know, just fucking flip her over and you're defending that spot. Right, so... Ah. During Operation Barbarossa in 1941, the Germans received at least 190 178s, mostly new, which were being used by reconnaissance units under the designation Panzerspeerwagen, whatever, P204F. Of these, 107 were lost that year. This included some radio-equipped versions, known as the Funk. Uh, by May 1931, uh, May, May 31, 1943, 30 panards were still in use on the Eastern Front, fitted with spaced armor. After France was liberated, the 1E Groupement Mobile did reconnaissance, also used a mix of 178s, including modified versions. After the war, when uh, France were rebuilding and re-equipping, and re-expanding. Of course, they had uh, they were uh, col- they had colonized Indochina, which is uh, Vietnam now. Um, so for their forces over there, they actually re-equipped AMD 35s with a 75 millimeter short gun uh, as a sort of uh, close support weapon, because of course, knowing Indochina slash Vietnam sort of um, terrain, long range doesn't really do it, does it? No, no, it doesn't. But I mean, unless you're looking across the rice paddy, but yeah. However, if you want to build an AMD 35 or a Panard 178, you have mainly two options. You have the uh, the Tamiya one, which I think is quite an old kit in 35th scale, and you have two ICM ones, a standard and a command ve- uh, command vehicle, which has two radio antenna with the really weird French coils at the bottom that look way too oversized, but it's not actually oversized. (laughs) Yeah. Not much else about this vehicle, so we'll move on. We only have, don't worry, we have one, two, three, four four to go, and then I'll be shutting up. So up next, this one's a real short one, the Rhino Heavy Armoured Car. Um, Although its official name, uh, armored Heavy Australian, was also known as the Rhino, was an Australian-designed armored car from World War II. However, due to enemy action and design issues, the project remains in the prototype stage and was never mass-produced. On the onset of World War II, the United Kingdom was unable to fulfill the Commonwealth's demand for armored fighting vehicles. As a result, many Commonwealth countries embarked on developing their own AFVs. In mid to late 1941, the Australian Doctorate of Armored fighting vehicles production. I'm sure they could have. They didn't need it that long. Nope. The Australian Directorate of Armored Fighting Vehicles Production. You could have. Jesus Christ. Like, was there a, a a word count required on that one? That 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 sounds like you're padding out an 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 essay. Bro, that sounds like a bunch of cunts who just got together and were like, we're going to call ourselves something official and say we're doing something, but we're just going to come into work and drink coffee and, like, draw. Probably. So they issued a specification for a heavy armoured car. By 1942, two prototype hulls and turrets were constructed and tested on the same chassis. However, the vehicle was hampered by excessive weight, leading to the project's cancellation in 1943. The vehicle used a Canadian military pattern truck chassis and a rear-mounted GMC model 270 engine, similar to the ones used by the Canadian Fox armoured car. It was fitted with a welded armoured body made from Australian bulletproof plate with 30mm thickness in the front and 11 on the sides and rear. 
The welded tur turret, resembling that of a Crusader tank, offered 30 millimeters of all-round protection. Its armament included a quick-firing two-pounder Mark 9 gun and a coax 303 Vickers machine gun. A pilot model of an armored personnel carrier with an open top hull and no turret was also produced. I gotta say, there's not many photos of this armored car, but I don't know about the look. No, especially the rigid front there. It just looks wrong. What do you mean? It's ribbed for her pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Do I have a story for you from work yesterday? At uh, some point, is it? Is it? Is it's, it, it is that... not. It's not appropriate for the pod. Right. Okay. <laughs> we'll save that for afterwards. Um, yes. If you want to build one of these as a model, you're shit out of luck. I could not find even a resin cast kit for this. So, unfortunately, the Rhino heavy armored car will remain unknown. Up next, we have the T-17 Deerhound. The last three are all American. So, the T-17 Armoured Car, also known as the M5 Medium Armoured Car, and called the Deerhound by the British, was an American six-wheeled vehicle produced during World War II. Although the T-17 was ultimately overshadowed by the T-17E for British use, 250 units were built as a temporary solution for the US Army until the preferred M8 Armoured Car could be deployed. The T-17 armored car developed by Ford Motor Company was one of two designs submitted in response to a 1941 Ordnance Department requirement for a medium armored car alongside the Chevrolet T-17E1. A contract was awarded for one prototype of each model, leading to production contracts for 2,260 T-17s in January 1942, and an additional 1,500 in June 1942. The T-17E1 was also ordered in similar quantities. In early 1943, the U.S. Army sought to streamline its armoured vehicle programs. The Palmer Board, led by Brigadier General W.B. Palmer, was established to standardise designs. After winter tests, the Board recommended discontinuing all programs except the Ford T-22, which became the M8 Greyhound. The Board approved the completion of 250 T-17s already in production and suggested a utility version of the T-22 known as the M-20. The British Purchasing Commission re remained interested in both medium designs and requested trials by the U.S. Army Desert Warfare Board, which were completed in February 1943. The Chevrolet T-17E1 was deemed the superior design. Nevertheless, the U.S. Army authorized Ford to complete 250 T-17s as a stopgap measure until the M8 production began. The first 32 T-17s were produced in 1942, with the remaining 218 completed in 1943. In U.S. Army service, the T-17 was occasionally re referred to as the M M5 medium armored car, although it was never officially standardized. All, all, all T-17s had their 37mm guns removed and assigned to the Military Police Corps for patrol duties within the continental United States. <laughs> The T-17 armoured car was a 6x6 vehicle with a turret accommodating a, accommodating a crew of 5, driver, co-driver, gunner, loader and commander. Both the T-17 and the T-17E1 featured a turret designed by Rock Island Arsenal, equipped with a combination gun mount from the M3, M3 Lee medium tank. This setup included a 37mm M6 tank gun and a coax 30 cal uh, M1919 Browning machine gun with an additional M1919 machine gun mounted in the hull in the hull's bow. Uh, hot take, I think the T17 Deerhound looks better than the M8 Greyhound. Not gonna lie, same. I, yeah. I can't even lie, it just looks it, the it's I mean, the turret. The turret well. Yeah, the turret just looks it looks like a fucking Pershing turret in a in a, in well, a it, It's kind of like um a cross between the M3 Lee and the M3 Grant um, turret. I'm just, I'm just getting heavy Pershing and Sherman vibes from the turret. Honestly. Yeah, it's, a, it's that little sort of kick in the back. The yep. little space in the yep. yeah. Well, if you want to build a T17 Deerhound, unfortunately, the only one I could find was a conversion kit uh, from Best Value Models. We need, I uh, think, you need the M8 Greyhound as a base kit uh, to work with. Mm. So, if you really want to build one, you can. It's just going to require a lot of work. Have fun. Yeah. All right, second to last, the T-17E1 Staghound. Staghound! 
The T-17E1 armoured car, an American design from World War II, was used by British and Commonwealth forces under the name Staghound. Although it never saw frontline action with the US troops, the Staghound was used by various other countries af after the war and remained in service until the 1980s in some cases. In July 1941, the US Army Ordnance issued specifications for both a medium and heavy armoured car, leading to the development of the T-17 and the T-18 Boarhound, respectively. Ford Motor Company created a 6x6 prototype designated the T-17, while Chevrolet developed a 4x4 model known as the T-17E1. Because that's totally not confusing. <laughs> Concurrently, the British Purchasing Commission sought similar vehicles for use in North Africa. If adopted by the US, the T-17 would have been named the M6. Both Crazy. the T-17 and T-17E utilise the same turret designed by Rock Island Arsenal, with British specification influencing its features. This including accommodating at least two crew members in the turret and positioning the radio within the turret for proximity to the commander, as opposed to having the turret, as the Americans would do this, that have the turret way in the bottom, somewhere way far away from the commander, so you needed a separate person to operate it and then try and communicate with a commander in the radio. It's, it makes more sense to have the, the radio next to the commander. It, it does. It, like, it does. Like, um, yeah. Like, say on the M3 lead, the radio was like right down in the hull, right off of behind everyone, and the commander was sitting way, way, way up top in the third turret. <laughs> yeah. So, kind of the, up on that one. the British named the T-17E series Staghound after being impressed by the project, and in December 1941, they formally requested 300 vehicles. The U.S. Army initially authorized the production of 2,000 units in January 1942, and the British order was confirmed in March. Despite some initial flaws found during testing, further orders for 1,500 vehicles were placed. Production began in October 1942. In December 1942, the U.S. Army recommended cancelling larger armoured car designs in favour of the smaller M8 Greyhound. However, the British requested that the T-17E1 production continue under, le under Lend-Lease, resulting in a total of 3,844 Staghounds being produced. The Staghound featured advanced design elements, including two rear-facing six-cylinder engines with automatic transmissions and selectable two- and four-wheel drive. Each engine, each engine could be shut down independently while, while in motion. It also had manual power steering and a rigid hull structure that eliminated, eliminated the need for separate chassis. The Staghound arrived too late to, pa to participate in the North African campaign, where its armour, range and firepower could have been beneficial for reconnaissance. Instead, it first saw action in Italy, where its large size proved cumbersome on Europe's narrow roads and streets. It was primarily used at squadron and regimental headquarters, with three Staghounds assigned to each regimental headquarters and three to each squadron headquarters. The Staghound's utility impro improved as the Italian campaign became more mobile in mid-1944. And it also saw action in the Northwest Europe campaign. After the war, Staghounds were distributed to smaller NATO countries and in the Middle East. They were used during the Lebanese Civil War by both Christian and Muslim militias. The last Staghound variant offered for export was a Swiss model with an up upgraded armament, including 30mm and 47mm anti-tank guns. Uh, they did try to get Syria's, uh, Syria involved in the... Um, in purchasing them, but they did not want them. The variants, as you can see, we have a, a couple of variants here. Um, one with a very familiar turret on the top as well. <laughs> so we have the Mark One. It is a four x four, armed with a thirty-seven millimeter M6 and a thirty cal. Uh, saw service with uh, Britain, Free Polish, Canadian, New Zealand, Indian, Belgium uh, forces and was deployed in Italy, Greece, Northwest Europe. Post-war saw action in Greece, Cuba, Nicaragua, Lebanon and Rhodesia. Mark II uh, was a field conversion of the uh, Mark I with a 3-inch howitzer Mark I replacing the 37mm gun in the, in the turret. The Bell machine gun was removed. A Staghound Mark III featured a turret from a uh, featured a turret from a six pounder uh, Crusader tank with a 7.92 Baser machine gun. Uh, they some were refitted with an AEC armored car Mark III turret with a 75 millimeter gun. Uh, had no bow machine gun and reached the front lines in 1945. Uh, Post-war use uh, was included uh, Denmark and Lebanon. About 100 to 300 uh, units of the Mark III were 
produced. You had a command uh, stay account, which had the turret removed and additional wireless equipment installed. The T-17E2, also known as the stay account AA. It was a T-17E1 fitted with a Fraser Nash design turret mounting two 50 cal heavy machine guns. The turret was open topped with an electric hydraulic tra traverse system. About a thousand of these were produced between October 1943 and April 1944. That is the one bottom right. Hmm. Which ki uh, I kind of like the look of, i got to say. It reminds me of... Uh, what does that remind me of? Like a, Almost like a Bradley, the way the turret is yeah. like squared up. It's kind of got that uh, sort of... Yeah, a World War II Bradley look. Uh, you have the T-17E3, which is basically a T-17E1, fitted with the turret from a 75mm howitzer motor gun carriage M8, carrying a 75mm M2 or M3 howitzer. This variant was trialed in, in December 1943, but never mass-produced. You also had the Rad Panzer Staghound, a Swiss variant of the Mark I, replacing the 37 millimeter gun with a swiss 47 pack 41 gun and also you had a swiss prototype with a swiss machine gun replacing the bow machine gun and the main 35 37 millimeter gun replaced with a hispano suiza hs 820 automatic cannon unfortunately i couldn't find a photo of that one that one sounds pretty damn cool and if you want to build a stag count you have quite a few options mostly from bronco mm. however and uh, 35th, you do have one from Tamiya, but that is a collaboration with the Tallery, so I don't know if you'd want that. You. <laughs> um, the oh. rest, the rest are all Broncos. So you have the Canadian T17 E1 Staghound Mark One with the rocket, the 60-pound rocket launch system, which I think, I think Dennis has built one of these. I think Dennis built one of those. Um. You have a standard Mark One, but with the uh, with the, uh, late production twelve foot assault bridge attached to the sides. You have the uh, AA armored car one variant in the bottom middle here. You have the uh, Staghound AC Mark One, which is the command variant, uh, late production as well. And also you have the Staghound Mark Three armored car, which has the Crusader turret with the six pounder on it. Uh, I think out of all of these, I would want to build the middle two. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely with you, especially the AA variant, dude. Like, not only would that be a really cool World War II build, but uh, HIDF the fuck out of that with a little cub cage on top. Oh, that's the great that's the great thing about all these armored cars. They could all be HIDF because they all used after the war. Yeah, it's just like literally perfect. Oh my god, dude. Yeah. The AA variant just looks so hot. <laughs> like, look at that. That's, oh. All right. And last but not least, the T-18 Boarhound. This is one I've got to see up close and personal at the uh, Bovington Tank Museum. Nice. So the T-18 Boarhound was a heavy American armored car produced in limited quant quantities for the British Army during World War II. In July 1941, the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps issued specifications for a heavy armored car alongside a medium uh, armored car specification, which led to the T-17 Deerhound and Staghound. The prototype was developed by Yellow Coach Company in 1942. It was a large 8x8 vehicle, meaning all eight wheels were driven. I bet that thing had insane torque. Uh, the, the maintenance, bro. The maintenance. Oh, I feel Fuck for the that. mechanics, eh? Uh, <laughs> And it had four wheels that were used for steering. The vehicle yeah. weighed 26 tons, similar to contemporary medium tanks, and was heavily wow. armored. Initially, it was armed with a 37mm M6 gun in the turret and a coax 30 cal, with an additional 30 cal in the bow. Recognizing that the 37mm metal, 37 millimeter gun's anti-tank capabilities were inadequate, the, pro the production version, the T-18E2, known as the Boarhound to the British, was, up was upgraded with a 57mm M1 gun, the American variant of the British quick-firing six-pounder. The US Army showed only limited interest in the T-18 Boarhound, retaining just the first three production models. The British Army initially ordered 2,500 units, but high production costs and poor, and poor cross-country performance led to the cancellation of the order after only 27 were delivered to North Africa. The T-18 saw minimal combat use, primarily serving in defensive roles and convoy operations in North Africa. 
Some were reportedly adapted for special duties in the rear echelon. By late 1942, about eight boar hounds were assigned to the 8th Army, where they were used sparingly in support and reconnaissance roles, but none saw significant action. The sole surviving T-18 boar hound is displayed at the Tank Museum in Bovington, UK. As a wheeled vehicle designed for desert conditions, the T-18 was too heavy for effective use, despite its relatively high top speed of 80 kilometers an hour. Jesus. Uh, its acceleration and maneuverability was hindered by its f- thick frontal armor, which could reach up to 40 millimeters in places. Jesus. Could you imagine doing 80k in this thing? I'd be no. scared. Uh, absolutely terrified. I, I gotta say, though, uh, looking at this thing, it's like you look at all the other armored cars where they're all, you know, like the Staghound and all that. There's these small little run, like shoot and scoot, you know, sort of nippy looking things. And then the yep. Warhound is just like, come at me, bro. <laughs> Quite literally, it looks like it's like <laughs> it's 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 got this hyper aggressive look to it. It's just like it's like I'm not running. <laughs> Heavy breathing ensues. I mean, 26 tons at 80k an hour. That thing could ram anything it, it wanted. <coughs> I mean, it's a pity. It just looks so cool as an armored car. Bro, could you imagine that thing in the f- fucking Normandy? Oh yeah, that would have been cool. And if you want to build a T-18 Boarhound, um, again, only one I could find is on 72nd scale from Etsy. And it is a 3D printed version. So, unfortunate we don't have a proper kit for it. <sighs> but, uh, I mean, if this was a proper, like, 35th scale kit, I would buy it in a heartbeat. Yeah, I'd go on the wish list for sure. And that is it for Allied Armored Cars. This one uh, went on for a little bit, but we haven't done an episode in a while, so yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. So we're going to have a brief intermission, then we're going to get into the hobby news, which we're going to go through fairly quickly, as well as all the whips and all of that. So we'll be back in a minute. And we are back with the hobby news. And of course, we haven't done an episode in a while, so there's going to be quite a lot, but we're just going to sort of burn through them fairly quickly. And all the, these are all the ones that uh, we are interested in. First up, you do have from Mini Art in 48 scale their P47D 28RA Thunderbolt. Continuing nice. on with their new line of 48 scale Thunderbolt, these are Pacific Theatre Operation Thunderbolts, which uh, I would absolutely love to have because it's, you know, Pacific Theatre. Yes. Up next from I Love Kit, we have the CCKW 352 with an M2A1 machine gun turret version. This is uh, the. What do they call these trucks? Half. Um, three quarter tons? One tonners? I don't know. I think there were three tons. Three tonner? So this is a three ton truck with a 50 cal mounted on it, and it is towing an M2A1 105mm howitzer? I think it's a 105. Must be. Like Up next from Gecko Models in 16 scale, we have the Desert Fox Erwin Rommel uh, with a set of binoculars. And, yep, just 16 scale Erwin Rommel. The first what one the that fuck? I think Garrison would like from Border Model, we have an SDKFZ 251 Alpha D with an R35 turret attached to the top, which um, I gotta say, I am all about. I kind of like remember, it. I remember we talked about this before. Mm. The two five one with R with the R thirty five turret. That's I kind of like it. Awesome. I love it. Uh, also, loving the box art here. You got the two German guys are having a break, and then you got the French resistance fighters about to fuck shit up. Well, you see, you got the third resistance fighter down there, the goose attacking <laughs> the, the Germans. <laughs> Preemptive strike. <laughs> And from Tamiya, they announced their brand new tooled Pan, uh, Panzer 1 Alphs B coming out in Ooh. 35th scale. Uh, this one will probably prove to be popular because it is Tamiya. Not only that, but their last, like, what was it, their Panzer 1? Mm. They did the desert version. Or was that a Panzer 2? That was a Panzer 2. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely an upgrade. Even though mm. it's not the same thing. Yeah. Up next from Ming, they're, uh, they're bringing out a Spice Harvester. Don't know what scale it is, but it is part of the Dune series. And I really want a lot of the Dune uh, large-scale stuff, but 
they are hella expensive. But Rip. if you're onto the Dune stuff, the brand new Spice Harvester, something you'd want to get. Nice. Next from Gecko Models in 16th scale, we have the Universal Carrier Mark One. So I think something like a Universal Carrier in 16th scale is appropriate. I mean, you get a lot of detail into it, but it's not too overly big. Uh, you have photo etch and decals, a fully detailed driving compartment, workable track link parts. Um, unfortunately, it does not include the V8 engine parts. Oh. And kit does not include any crew figures. Which kind Why of- show them on the box if exactly. you don't include them? Well, because then they can sell it all separately and charge you even more for it. However, however, this is New Zealand. This is a New Zealand universal carrier, so I am quite happy. Nice. Also, in 16 scale from Gecko, oh. they are re- they are releasing a Panzer II Alf C. Um, again, no tank crew is uh, supplied. Uh, suspension and track links are workable. And uh, contains interior parts for the turret. So again, another. This is another uh, tank that is good for 16 scale. It's not too large, and I, I would like to have one. Up next, follow, uh, following the large scale from Border, we have a Focke Wolf 190A8. But this is a uh, four-in-one kit. So you could have an A8 R2, R6, R7, or R8 uh, variant. This nice. is in third, the new 35th scale. Uh, includes photo etch, um, photo, uh, photo etch armor and thickened glass for the R7 and R8 models, uh, rocket launcher for the R5, uh, R6 model, uh, brass gun barrels for the Mark 108, and four schemes for the camouflage. Uh, i got to say, the uh, Focke Wolves with the snake going down the fuselage, kind of fuck. Uh, that shit goes hard as fuck, yeah. And it's and, in 35th scale? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. I, w- I wouldn't mind trying one of Border's 35th scale aircraft. I really Same. wouldn't mind it. It'd be great to have it crap. <gasps> From oh, ICM, unfortunately it's in 72nd scale, but they have a Leopard 2A6 Armed Forces of Ukraine. Um, this comes with an, um, cage armor, and it has various markings for all the Leopards being used by the Ukraine forces. I'm sure some of these are now sitting inside Russia as well. <coughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Battle of Curse 2.0, bitch. Yes. From ICM in 35th scale, we have brand new molds of Montgomery and his staff if you are into doing more figures. Uh, so you have Field Marshal Montgomery, a Lieutenant General, a Major, and a Radio Operator Soldier. Set, uh, set shows the scene of Montgomery's headquarters during combat operations in Europe. Uh, detailed reproduction of British military uniforms from World War II. So if you are into figures and doing sort of uh, rear echelon type dioramas, this will be one for you. Uh, from DAC models, I think it's, yeah, DAC models, or is it OAK? O-A-K. Ah. I can't, whatever. <laughs> uh, they are bringing out the, fuck, what is this? US M1224 Max Pro MRAP and a US MHMMWV M1114. Fuck me, you Americans. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Chill out with the names. You don't have to, like, you don't need 50 letters. Yes, we do. Basically, you have an M- MRAP and a Humvee in 35th scale, brand new. And the box art shows them showing dominance over a Russian vehicle. All about it. Yes. Um, are these things on the front? Are these like um, wire cutters or something? No, those are Rhino. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they're Rhino like ID detectors. How do they work? Uh, I honestly can't remember. I carried one in a backpack for a little while, like a version of that. Uh, I could hey, be how- wrong, but I, I think that's what it is. It, how like, do you? Detects, how do I like, the- Yeah. I think it blocks magnetic signals. Huh. So, like, if there's, like, a like a trigger, like a, little, like a cell phone trigger to set off an ID or something like that, it'll uh, block the... Um, the sort of like, signal. 
Yeah, like whenever we did building clearing and I carried the uh, the backpack rhino, like I would stack up as like the second man by like an entryway, and then like they would flow past me. So the whole idea is that I'm blocking the signal. All right. While huh. everyone gets in, just in case there's an ID there. Right. Okay. That's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, from Ming in 35th scale, we have a German PKW K1 Kubelwagen Type 82 uh, in North African. Uh, so this would be the uh, Deutsches Afrika Corps um, Kubelwagen. If you are into that kind of stuff. Uh, Academy are releasing with new tools an XF5F-1 Skyrocket. This is uh, wow. The interim between the this is what was designed between the F4F Wildcat and the F6F Hellcat. The uh, Skyrocket. Um, if it you want to know more about like this weird, the 50s. pardon. It definitely looks like the fifties. It was actually designed in nineteen forties. Really? Yeah, it was uh, supposed to be the. Predecessor of the um, Wildcat, but it never went anywhere. It was armed with two fifties and two twenty millimeter cannons, so this thing was heavily armed. If you want to know more information about the uh, Skyrocket, uh, Rex's hangar, he does a very good deep dive into these things. However, I wouldn't mind having it, this kit because also it's got like the whole wet, yellow wing thing going on, and I'm all for it. It's pretty sweet looking. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It looks like something you'd see in Fallout Four. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, from... Uh, who is this? I think uh, it's... Uh, Platts. Platts, in conjunction with Eddard, are bringing out a A6M2B0 Fighter Type 21. Uh, these ones are the first carrier division based off the uh, carriers Akagi and Kaga. And they are in 148 scale with cartograph decals. So if you're into your zeros, this one might be one to look for. Dennis. Not me. Another one Garrison might like. Ooh. From Minia in 35th scale, they are bringing, they've been bringing out all their um, M3 Stewarts lately. Well, of course, if you're going to bring out M3 Stewarts, you need to bring out a Stewart Mark I Honey. Early production has a full interior kit to it. Ooh. As well as photo etch, five decal options as well. Uh, I am fond of the Stuart Mark One in a with the um, Quanta scheme, although they've gotten the uh, as usual they get the blue wrong. It's not supposed to be blue. That is not supposed to be a shade of blue. It is actually uh, called shale. It's a type of dark grey. They just everyone looks at that one Matilda that's got a Quanta scheme with blue on it, and it's wrong. It's not blue. Quanta never never had blue. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> not to say you're good bro <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good now i'm good now um but good. either way good, good, good. either way i'd love to have this kit especially because it's got the full uh interior and there's that oh, yes. like it's got the it's got this large t um hatch on the turret so you'll actually be able to see quite a lot in it right and plus with the front open as well more zeros from fine molds they are bringing out uh in the a6 m5 zero type 52 both of these, however, these are the exact same aircraft, but they are bringing out the Mitsubishi midterm model in 48 scale and the Nakajima. So Nakajima also built the Zero under license. So they, so I think there's some slight differences in between them, between yeah. Mitsubishi and Nakajima. Uh, Fine Molds has just given you the option of building one or the other. Good. And that's actually something that's quite good, to be honest. <coughs> Spend your money. <laughs> uh, Academy uh, bringing out some new parts for their 72nd scale US Navy PV-1 patrol bomber. Nice. Uh, something I'd love to have one of these. This is, um, I think it's the US version of the Ventura. Um, it looks freaking sweet. Oh yeah, these are sweet, sweet vehicles. Uh, sweet aircraft. So, New parts to it if you're into that kind of thing. HODF. Oh my god! From IBG in 35th scale, they are bringing out the Italian Autocannon 3RO with the 90-53 gun with a crew of four. This is the Italian 90mm cannon. Uh, I think it's set up as an anti-aircraft um, 
Dude. set up with the truck and everything. Is it just me or do these um, uh, outriggers look really large? They look large, but I like, want They look it. like they would be a pain in the nuts to deploy. Yes, but I want it. But yeah, this would be something really cool to build. Bro, that on an HIDF island with pop tires, <laughs> with like yeah. wooden logs around it. Oh my god. From Trumpeter in 30, 35th scale, they're bringing out an M1915 gun truck. These are one of the heavy gun trucks in Afghanistan that were uh, up armored and, well, it's a gun truck basically, but fairly cool idea. I quite like it. That is an HIDF if you ever want one. Uh, yes. Oh! From Rifle Models. Uh, they are bringing out an M4A4 Sherman. This is a... Uh, I, f I have a feeling it is a Chinese M4A4 Sherman. It just by Chinese. looking at the decals on the side. Um, however, I would love to build this because the... Uh, yeah, the scheme on it, the design with the... I, um, the Goofy Tiger. I don't know. It's cross-eyed. It is. Cat thing i don't know me if i was a tank yeah it's got a really goofy sort of cat design painted on the mantlet and the front and the turret and i love it and i would love to have this so rifle model doing some good work bringing out more shermans i am down for it hell yeah and it's an a4 which is all oh my god yeah. and from magic factory they are bringing out 35th scale an m7 a3 beefus bradley fire support uh team vehicle I have no idea how it differs from an M3 or an M2 Bradley, but I don't do modern vehicles, so someone else will have to tell us. However, it does look pretty cool, and I have a feeling with the HIMARS in the back, you got the standard HIMARS and then the big fucking missile. Is this a play on Ukraine? Who knows? I don't know. I don't think they would have supplied Ukraine with the M7 Bradley, would they? No. Nah. Yeah, it's a bit too new, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah. However, I didn't. I were, I hope a lot of the stuff on the sides is molded on because otherwise that would be a pain in the absolute nuts to try and put together. Uh, yeah, that would has be. a lot of tie-on areas and go. And that is it for hobby news. We uh, kind of had to go through it just because there was a lot on there. So now we're going to talk about what we've been working on lately. And first up, I'm going to shut up now because Garrison can talk about what he's been working on. Right on. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've been working on, slowly but surely, this Horizon Island Defense Force 2030 to know Revolution diorama, which is basically going to be the outskirts of Georgetown, one of the biggest cities on Tanoa. And essentially, it's a early Bradley with a cope cage I made, uh, done up in a custom HIDF camo with ERA bricks and a bunch of infantry offloading uh, to go into that broken... Oh my god, excuse me. Oh, shit. Pardon me, I'm sorry. Um, but the infantry will be offloading to go into the broken fence. It's going to be very heavily... Uh, it's going to have a lot of heavy veg. Uh, two dead fighters. And yeah, it's... Uh, been losing my mojo lately, not going to lie. Um, like tonight, I started to paint the... Uh, HIDF figures kits, and I got three of them done, and I stopped. I just got kind of bleh. So it's it's a slow process right now, but we're you're getting there slowly but surely. Uh, it's looking pretty cool. I mean, the the camo on the Bradley is pretty sweet. I gotta say, they need armies need to start putting camos onto vehicles more often. I know, dude. It's like something come on. you gotta make them look cool, not just tan. <laughs> Kark Tan, your favorite. <laughs> I will point out one thing. How does the Bradley use the tow launcher with yeah, the rope cage I'll, on it? Uh, we're not going to talk about that. Ah, uh, it's broken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In lore, the tow is broken and they no longer use it. And now yes. it's just reactive armor. Yes. Alright, and then next up, we got, uh, I made a hoodie for, 
uh, an upcoming model show that shows off my YouTube and Instagram. So it's got a Pershing on the front that says Greg's Diorama Scale Models, and on the back it's got my logo. And then top right... Where's, where's the slogan oh. I, uh, I told you? Yeah, I, if, <laughs> I, if you remember, I couldn't go in and edit it because I already bought it. I was like, fuck. <laughs> so I really wanted to put that slogan on there. <laughs> um, but the top right, I bought a rifle, which is nice. It's a Smith & Wesson Sport 3 with a new uh, buttstock, my grip pods from the Marine Corps, flashlight with a pressure pad, three times magnifier, and a hollow sun optic. And uh, shoots great, really fun. And then the bottom right there, you can kind of see the infantry staged uh, once, you know, offloading and going to the side of the house, like I said in the last section. But that's really all I've been up to. Not too much. And so oh, this I... is what I work. I painted up yesterday just because I'm at a stage with two builds where they're both a pain in the nuts and I didn't want to do it. So instead I printed off this uh, bust of a Death Corps of Krieg um, soldier and yeah, basically just spent all day yesterday using it to practice painting. And I got to say it makes for a very relaxing day. I think Good. I'm going to do a few more. Um, I'm going to do a bit more uh, bust painting because it was actually quite good and it, it came out a lot better than I thought it would. Good. Well, it looks great. And the other thing I've been working on is, is the interior for a Focke-Wulf 200 C8 Condor. Um, this is the Trumpeter 172nd scale Condor, which is basically their 48th scaled right down to 72nd. So it's got the same amount of detail as a 48 scale aircraft, which I am all about. So now I've got it closed up with horrendous seam lines. So those are filled with putty and I don't want to deal with it right now. So hence why I painted the bust. <laughs> it'd be like that, my guy. It'd be like that. Yeah, it's kind of a pity. The, the interior looks really good and it's now closed up and you can barely see it. But you can see it enough in areas that if I didn't paint it like this, it would be noticeable. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. And also, I know it's there. There you go. All right, uh, coming up here in literally a couple hours is the last day for the Pacific Theater Group build and the uh, Sci-Fi Group build. So submit your stuff. I mean, by the time y'all hear this, it's fucking over anyways. Yeah. But uh, submit your shit, and uh, we'll be doing an episode here within the next couple weeks going over the winner and showing off all the entries. I think we'll probably... Wait, wait. I think it'll just be part of an episode. I think, or maybe we'll do it as part of the live stream. We got, we'll sort, we'll we'll sort something out. I think. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll figure something out. And same with the science fiction group build. All right. Now, when you have finished listening or watching our episode, you should go along and check out all the other guys, uh, all the other um, podcasts on the Bench Scale Model Podcast, Fruit Cutters Union. Uh, well, you can't listen to new episodes of them because they've. Uh, gone on a permanent hiatus but you should go listen to their other stuff you got small subjects modeling insanity podcast all of those guys so go and check them out after you're listening to us and as usual at the end of an episode we like to thank our patreon supporters paul gallagher lord flaky robert judson braille masteroni and our pinju follow-up robert brisbane you guys are awesome you guys support the podcast in a way where we can keep things running thank so, you so that is the end of our episode. It's been a hot minute since we've managed to record something. I'm kind of glad we did. <laughs> yeah, to be honest. yeah, me, me, me too. You know, kind of missed it. Same. It's unfortunate Clint couldn't be here, but he's dealing with some some family stuff right now. So he's doing like the world's best treasure hunt, finding guns in a hoarder's house. Pretty much. <laughs> and vacuums. Oh, yeah, that as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we should probably close this out. So, you have been listening or watching to the Micro Machines podcast. We thank you from the bottom of our house for supporting us and listening. We will see you guys next time. Um, a little quick announcement at the end of this. So, we are going to be switching up things slightly. Instead of a regular episode every week or two weeks or whenever we can, we are also going to be start doing live streams. So, um it will probably end up being standard episode and then a live stream episode so 
Um, keep an eye out for those. We've done one already, uh, and we're going to be looking into doing others where we can get friends in and stuff like that and just have a, a build and bullshit session. And yeah, that's what we're going to be doing. But uh, until then, we would like to thank you for listening and supporting, and we will see you next time, whether in live stream or recorded. Bye for now. Pieces. <laughs>